Good afternoon and welcome back to Green Island Gardens. This is a beautiful searing June summer day, perfect time in any garden to come and admire the roses. For those that know Green Island Gardens, you'll know that I'm not a huge rose fan and we don't actually grow that many roses, mostly for the reasons I outlined in my uh, garden design videos previously about positive attributes for plants. And roses generally do not tend to have many positive attributes. They have a lot of negative ones, but they generally give a very short season of interest and don't provide attractive foliage or winter interest. And in addition to that, they're very high maintenance plants uh, and they suffer from a lot of pests and diseases. However, there's one group of roses which I absolutely love and I do grow lots of them here at Green Island and they're called rambling roses. So you may be familiar with climbing roses, which people often grow up a, a, a house wall or up a pergola, for example. But ramblers are even more vigorous than climbers and have the potential to go even up to 60 feet high, um, some of the really tallest ones. There are less vigorous ones and you can select uh, the variety according to the, the uh, support that you want to grow the, the uh, rows up. But for example, this one behind me here, is called Rosa Paul's Himalayan Musk. It's one of the earliest ramblers to flower and it has the most delicious, sweet perfume, which it gives off in the whole area around it. We've cho chosen to grow a lot of our rambling roses up what was an old apple and pear orchard here at Green Island. And a lot of the fruit trees had passed their fruiting days and had been poorly pruned. So rather than take them all down, I decided to use the trees and the structure to actually support the rambling roses. And I started doing this probably about 20 years ago. Um, and unfortunately, some of those trees have now actually died completely or they've rotted away and are falling out. So you can see this one here, you'll see from the previous pictures that actually we've lost half of the tree and we've had to prune half of the rose away as well. But it's quite easy to do that. And once it's finished flowering, we will tie in some of these new growths and make it look a bit tidier. So just opposite Paul's Himalayan musk on the path, we've got this one here. This one is called Rosa Windermere. Not nearly such a vigorous one. It's been here 20 years. And unfortunately, as I explained, its support, the apple tree, came down last year. And I hummed and hard what to do with the rose, but actually I decided to just leave it as it, as it is growing. These new growths we will tie in like this in, in a, a few weeks time. But for now, we've got this huge profusion of lovely pink scented flowers. But the beauty of this one is that it's a repeat flowerer. And I have photographs of last November and December when the rose was still covered in flowers, even though the leaves have all gone and it looks like a midwinter scene. This one here, again, quite small flowers on it. Again, an early flowering variety. It's called Rosa Aviateur Blériot, a French aviator it was named after in the early 20th century. Um, but this has been here quite a long time, growing up this uh, Malus tree. And you can see it's planted just a little bit away from the trunk of the tree and then trained up into it. This is a really pretty variety large flowers and they almost look like old-fashioned shrub roses. This one's called Rosa Breeze Hill. Really, really pretty. The rose behind me climbing up into the Catalpa Erebescens atropurpurea um, is called Rosa Mrs. E. W. Flight. Prolific flowerer, um, but it gives a, a season of interest. You can see just at the time the leaves are beginning to come out on the Catalpa. After the rose has finished blooming, the catalpa then does its thing, producing its lovely panicles of white foxglove-like flowers through the summer. This is another prolific flowerer, um, Ghislaine de Feligonde, it's called. Um, another good point about a lot of these rambling roses is that they produce beautiful hips, uh, which um, give you prolonged interest in the autumn. I often cut a lot of the rose hips to use in the autumn uh, bouquets and even at the Christmas wreaths, very successful for that. But the other good thing about these rambling roses is that they don't tend to suffer all the diseases and things um, that the other roses do. You don't tend to get all the black spot, they tend to keep much shiny 
shinier, glossy foliage um, and quite attractive as well. I have just noticed a few little aphids on some of the buds here, but really it doesn't bother me in the slightest. I look at those and to me that sings out, that's food for my blue tits to feed their babies in the nests at the moment. So it really doesn't bother me that they, they suffer with a few aphids and things because you just don't get close enough to um, be aware that they might be spoiling the blooms. Now this one is a bit of a curious one. It's called Rosa Phyllis Bide. Very pretty, particularly as the flowers come out. They do fade a bit uh, as they go past. Um, but you can see it's really not grown uh, like you would expect a rambler to at all. Um, why that is, I'm not quite sure. It's probably a fairly poor bit of soil here, but nevertheless, it makes a nice companion for the small cherry tree there. Another really pretty one here. This one's Rosa Rural England. Again, it's been here quite some time and it hasn't really got up going up the tree as it was designed to. Um, perhaps we might give it a little more encouragement this autumn and tie it back in. Nevertheless, another lovely variety which has beautiful hips in the autumn. The last rambling rose I'm going to show you is this beautiful white one behind here. We actually moved that one when we moved here, so I'm not 100% sure of the variety. Uh, the size of it leads me to think maybe Kifscape, but I don't think it is. Um, but you can see that it's gone, I reckon, up to about 50 feet up into the birch tree behind me. Again, beautifully scented variety and has fabulous orange clusters of hips all through the autumn and winter. So if you'd like to plant a rambling rose in your own garden, um, which we're going to demonstrate now, uh, this one is called Perennial Blue. Um, Jason is just clearing an area on the tree that we've selected that we're going to grow it up in the background there. Um, we're going to try and plant it so that it's going to get enough moisture when it does fall from the sky, if that's possible. You don't want to plant it right close up next to the trunk of the tree because it would really struggle and compete for any moisture. So a lot of people might be um, posting comments saying that this isn't the right time of year for planting roses. Traditionally, planting time always used to be autumn or spring, any time when the, water, when the soil was not either waterlogged or frozen. But actually, this, was, um, this came about in the previous days when plants were all bought bare-rooted. So they were grown in a nursery and then dug up and sent off to their new homes. And that is correct. That is the right time to plant those. But nowadays, everything is container grown. So it's grown from very small in a container. And this means that you can actually plant them whenever you like, with the one proviso that you remember to water it. Obviously in the drought we're having at the moment, we're watering the plant before it goes in and it will get a really good soaking afterwards and then at least two or three times a week for the rest of this season and that should see it through. So Jason's got the hole dug out more or less the size of the depth of the spade now, which is almost deep enough. But our soil is particularly poor and very, very compacted and very hard underneath. So he's, I'm going to pass over to him to explain how to prepare the hole properly to ensure the best chance for the rose once it's planted. Once you've dug your hole, it's always a good idea to use your fork. Put your fork in to the bottom of your hole and agitate the soil and break it up even further. That just gives your roots a chance to get into the soil because here it is very, very hard and very compacted. It's a gradual job, and if you start on one side of the hole, work your way around two or three times, spending a little bit of time in the middle, you can see in no time at all, you've agitated that soil to a depth of about 25 mil or an inch. Once you've done that, you don't just want your roots to go down, because you want your climbing rows to also have stability. So for stability, you need some lateral travel on your roots. Again, you take your fork and you agitate the side of your hole. And obviously for health and safety purposes, with your fork, you're always working away from yourself. And you just repeat that all the way around the hole. Once again, you're agitating the side of your hole to make sure you get some lateral spread 
on your roots. Okay, so we've now prepped our hole. We've dug it to the depth of one spit, which is that which is measured against the pot that we're planting from. That's roughly double the size of the pot that the rose is coming out of. We've agitated the base, we've agitated the side. But as this is very, very dry and compacted soil, we're just gonna put a couple of handfuls of peat-free general purpose compost into the base of the hole, like so. We'll spread that around and that will just add some additional nutrients to the hole and help the roots to get away. So the rose that we're planting today has been on the nursery for a little while and as you can see the roots have grown through the bottom of the pot. That needn't be a problem. What we're going to do instead of taking the rose out of the pot we're going to take the pot away from the rose. Using a pair of old secateurs, not our best ones, we just carefully cut down from the top of the pot to the base and then when you reach the base we're going to cut across to roughly the middle it looks a bit fiddly but it really isn't when you get to the middle just keep your way cutting down the pot being careful to avoid any of the main roots Put your secateurs away safely. You can then take the pot away from the plant. Now, I mentioned earlier we want to get some lateral spread on our roots. So where the plot, where the plant has been in the pot, again, we're just going to agitate the sides of the nursery growing medium, and that will release some of those roots that have been chasing themselves around the inside of the pot. As you would with any plant that you plant, you want to make sure that you orientate it in the right direction. In this case, we want it to grow up the tree, so the primary growth we will face towards the tree. Right, so that's still sitting a little bit low in the hole, so I reckon we can put an extra couple of handfuls of our peat-free compost into the base of the hole and that's no bad thing. Once again, off of the plant and the roots. Any long roots like this that are underneath, be careful not only to tuck them underneath the plant but just to give them a little bit of spread as well. The plant is now orientated in the direction that we want it to be and then you can carefully just start to backfill bringing back the soil into the hole evenly around the plant. And you ideally want to do this in two or three stages because you want to ensure that the soil that you've put around the plant is compacted around all the way around your planting hole do that in one of two ways. You can either stand up and heel it in or you can just form a fist and compact it down using your thumbs as a guide to make sure that you've got the correct compaction in your soil. So we've planted our rows to allow for a small reservoir of water just to concentrate when we water it around the base of the plant, allowing it time to sort its way down through the soil. Just want to show you here where we've planted and again how we've planted. There are two areas here to note. The first is, with, is the nursery line and that is the level of soil that the graft and the plant was planted into in the nursery and the second equally important is the grafting line where the rose is going growing from and that is clearly above soil level. So to help this rose on its way I'm going to put a couple of canes in on this occasion at about 45 degrees and I have got a very useful limb on the back of this tree that allows me to secure them. By placing these canes what we're basically doing is we're going to tie 
leaders from the rows into the canes so that we're orientating the, grow the growth in the way that we want it to go. So again, away from the roots, put a cane in at about 45 degrees, like so. I've already done one on the other side. Here, I've got this very useful limb that I can lock them into. But if you were doing this at home and using a stake or another tree such as this, you could run them either side of your trunk and then you could just tie them off with some twine on the other side just to hold them in place. So tying in, I've got three lengths of wire here. You can use twine and the fact that we're using wire it doesn't really matter in the long term because it's only going to be here for a short period of time. What I'm doing is I'm putting the wire around the back of the cane and I'm being careful just to put a couple of turns in the wire, bringing the leader over and then securing the leader once again with another couple of twists in the wire. Then I've twisted it, I just fold it off and you can see there that that leader has got plenty of travel and it's not tied in tightly. That's not the object of the exercise at all. All we want to do is orientate it in the right direction. Do the same on the other side. What you want to do is you want to go for the thicker leaders if you can. Get the thicker leaders in as like a trailing arm and these will follow their way up. But if you go for the thicker, stronger stems, that will form the structure of your growth. And then leave it in the direction that you want it to grow. And that's your rose tied in. So the only step left now to complete is to water. This is the water that the rose was sitting in for an hour before we planted it. And as you can see, we've got a little reservoir there for our water. And a very useful tip when you're planting anything like this or watering anything like this, especially on a really hot day, when the soil is very, very dry, especially if it's a little compacted, just put a quarter, a third, a half of your bucket in, leave it to settle and then put the rest in afterwards. And that way you don't get lots of runoff and water the areas that are furthest from the roots of the rows that you've just planted. So again, that started to settle. Just carefully add more water to your hole. And as that goes down, We'll put the rest of the bucket in. And as Fiona mentioned, I'll probably come back tomorrow and give it another bucket. And then after that, we'll do it every two or three days. Whenever you're planting something like this, what you don't want to encourage is a lazy plant. And if you water it every day, it will become lazy. By watering it every two or three days, as the water settles into the hole, the roots will follow the water down and go firmly into the soil and do their job deeper into the soil that your roots are, the more chances you have of a successful growing climbing rose. So grateful thanks to Jason for helping out on this very hot day digging the, the uh, hole to plant our rose. Um, but finally thank you very much everybody once again for watching and please remember to subscribe and like our YouTube channel.